Okay, uh, our next uh, speaker is Tom Killen from the uh, Voxel Agents. He is the guy who created uh, Train Conductor, so I've wasted far more time on his app than a lot of the apps here today. But um, I also did want to just quickly remind you that make sure you send your questions and uh, to the Gmail account and also the Twitter account. We're getting some really great questions already. So, um, yeah, make sure you do that. And I'll w welcome Tom to the stage. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, hang on. How's this work? OK, the slide's ongoing. Um, I'm Tom Killen from the Voxel Agents. And um, yeah, I just wanted to give a quick story about like how we sort of operate and what the kind of games that we make. And um, I'm also going to try and give you a quick overview of what the iPhone and Android markets sort of look like, basically compare and contrast the iPhone and Android, and basically describe why we, although we're, although we're open to going to Android and we're looking at going to Android in the future, we're still very much, we still consider ourselves to be iOS developers primarily. Um, but before I do that, I've got a small confession to make, and that's that I've actually made way too many slides for my talk. So I do have a strategy for this. Um, we apply it all the time in our work, and that's where we make a whole lot of content and we just use the really good stuff. So I'm going to apply that strategy to these slides. So um, yeah, now first of all, I'll just describe that when I was young, I, I was a Mario kid. Like I grew up in the age of the Super Nintendo, Sega Master System, all these old consoles. And these were really the types of games that I grew up, grew up that I loved. And I would spend hours and hours of my life making these games. But my first system was actually a Commodore 64. And for those of you who remember this, this is where you had to like type in all the code and that's how you got your game. So you didn't just buy the cartridge, you'd have to sit there for hours and then program the game and then you'd be able to play it. So my dad, he would actually go to work and he'd download these pages and pages of code and not just sit there typing all night. And that's, that's how I started making games. So I've been doing it pretty much all my life, that means, like since I was about eight years old. But um, <clears throat> from these early beginnings, I eventually, I grew up. And this was a sad moment to me. I was suddenly in this dizzying world where there were all these different options for games. You know, you had more platforms, the PlayStation, the Xbox, all these different platforms came out. And this is what the world was kind of looking like when I went into uni. It was Space Marines. These were the games which I loved. I just really wanted to make Space Marine games, big shooters, like, you know, ugly, big brown dudes who would, like, kill everyone in sight. That was the kind of game I wanted to make. But then, as I finished uni, I sort of got the impression, I, I sort of learnt more about how the industry functioned. And I realized that these big budget games weren't actually all that creative. I mean, a few individuals would have a lot of creative control over what was done. But most developers, they'd just be stuck in their box grinding out, you know, you'd have to make 50 pot plants every day. And um, this isn't the type of developer that I wanted to be. I wanted to be more creative in my life. Like, I essentially realized that these big AAA titles were just mass produced, Justin Bieber, you know, not, not my thing. <clears throat> but at the end of uni, this wave of indie games came through. I think Braid was probably the first, but also Flow was an important one. And you know, all these different indie games, which you know, they were made by guys who, would, <clears throat> who just wanted to be really creative. And they, did, they weren't really working for a big publisher. Well, by definition, they weren't working for a publisher. But they had the passion and they had the drive to do what they wanted to do. This opened my mind. This made me realize the type of game that I wanted to make. I wanted to be an indie game developer. I was no longer interested at all in working with the big AAA studios. So I asked myself, where do indie games fit in? And pretty much everywhere, like all of these different categories of games, all these different categories of gaming, all of them have significant space for indies to, to make their mark. <coughs> so that's when we basically decided to make the Voxel Agents. And we had to consider where we were going to distribute our apps, what kind of app we were going to make, and who our audience was. So there's heaps of options, but we basically looked at which was best for us? What kind of games were we making? We were making small, sharp, really polished experiences. And those, and those were the types of games we wanted to bring to market. So ultimately, it was fortuitous for us that that's when the iPhone market really opened up. This was back in 2009. So we chose to make iPhone games. This was a really good choice for a lot of reasons. Like primarily, there was a very low barrier to entry. Previously in gaming, it, you had to get the support of a major publisher to be able to get onto the Xbox or these big platforms. Whereas the Apple, Apple had done something revolutionary. They basically said, anyone with $100 and a Mac, you'd be allowed to make iPhone apps. So we thought, yep, that's for us. It was a big market, it was growing, and it was obviously you know, going to be the next big thing. The audience is still growing quite massively. But um, most significantly for us, the big publishers hadn't dominated that market yet. It was a wide open space. Anyone, like Flight Control was the number one app. That was like the really hot thing when we were young, or well, when we started up. And so, 
it's a cool game. <laughs> but yeah, but um, it sort of, Firemint was a relatively small company. Um, you know, I think there were maybe 40 people then or around that mark. And so small, small developers could absolutely dominate these charts. So that's where we thought, that's where we could have our greatest opportunity for success. And so if you look at mobile gaming, over the years have actually grown in popularity. So uh, this slide is basically the blue is console games, and that little green one is iPhone, the iPhone market. And it's getting bigger. It's still, consoles are still a lot bigger in terms of revenue, but iPhone gaming is, is taking up a bigger slice of that pie. And uh, in the future, it looks like it's going to be, you know, it's going to just like keep on expanding and take over that graph. So there's lots of devices you can go on to. So yeah, obviously iPhone, Android are the big ones, but you've also got Nokia and Blackberry. Yeah, whatever. It's pretty much iPhone and Android. <clears throat> but and this graph really gives it away. So it's a bit it, it's a bit hard to see, but like it was really important, so I wanted to include it. You can see those two really big lines. They're iPhone and Android. All those other lines, that's everyone else. So it's pretty much it's a two horse game right now. And um, <clears throat> what's also significant in this graph is that the green segment is the number of free downloads, and the pink is the number of paid. So if you look at Android, even though it's selling much less, even th even though it's pushing much less downloads, it actually has more free downloads which kind of gives you a, a hint of how that market's functioning. <laughs> so iPhone is delivering more paying users. They're downloading more apps and they're more willing to buy them. So that's why, it's still, that's why we still focus on iOS. We hold a lot of hope for Android and you know, personally I use an Android. I really want that to succeed as a device, but it's still pretty much iOS. So iOS, it has a lot of benefits compared to Android. <laughs> Primary, primary among these is that it's got a single point of distribution. You don't need to worry about heaps and heaps of different markets. It's not fragmented in the way the and, that Android is fragmented. And it's, and it's driving downloads more rapid, well, it's driving a lot more downloads than Android is currently. Uh, it does have disadvantages. It's um, so competitive, like mind-blowingly competitive. And there's an increase in cost in development. So when we made our first app, I think we had about $12,000 and that sustained us for about nine months. Um, now that wouldn't even last a month. Like, you know, it's just like the cost of develop development is increasing exponentially over the years. So, but um, uh, it's also worth noting that the market share of the iPhone is sort of stabilizing. So Android and different platforms are sort of, you know, they're sort of contained iPhone, but the market as itself is still growing quite rapidly. So, you know, even though the market share is kind of stabilized, it's still like a, a quickly growing audience. <clears throat> It's also worth looking at the iPad in particular because the iPad sort of changes the way you approach mobile gaming. Um, it's not actually a mobile device. Most people use it at home and um, it's, they're using it while they watch TV and they're using it instead of their computer. So it's really not an on-the-go device. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people like us do because we're the you know, tech-savvy elite or whatever. But, um, but most everyday consumers, they just use it sort of as a consumer device, like at home to consume content. And it's, it's kind of like a TV. So, that presents a lot of potential for gaming because if you look at people when they're just on their couch watching TV, they could also be playing a game while they're watching TV, you know, in the ad breaks. It's really just a, you know, a, a different ball game to the iPhone itself. <clears throat> so yeah, the iPhone's looking pretty hot. But it's worth considering Android because it is catching up fast. There's over half a million Android devices activated every single day. What's less clear though is how many of these are actually full powered, you know, full on smartphones capable of playing games. Because a lot of these Android devices are really just designed for, you know, simple web devices, looking at email and Facebook. But um, the daily app installs may be approaching iOS install rates. Um, I'm not too certain of this because it was just from one source, Flurry, but um, you know, they have a lot of data. So, but basically it looks like the number of apps being installed every day on Android devices are uh, approaching the number of apps installed every day on iOS devices. Um, it's also much more popular in Asia, in the USA, and Europe. Like Australia is sort of odd in the way the iPhone has dominance here. Um, I think it's like 80% of, of smartphones are iPhone in Australia. Worldwide, it's more like 40%. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's not all apply for Android. So you know they're low-powered devices, and um, many developers who did leave the iPhone and go to Android early on in the game, they're actually many of them are starting to come back to the iPhone. Um, I think it was Flurry again who reported that, um, well, yeah, that they saw an in, they saw an uptick in the proportion of projects that were created that were for iOS compared to Android. So less developed, so a lot of developers who explored there early are actually starting to come back to iPhone when they discover that you know monetization and distribution are a little bit more difficult on Android than iPhone. <coughs> okay, so mobile games. 
mobile games, they're basically a hit-driven industry. It's kind of like the music industry, I guess, in that you know, there's, a, there's a lot of songs that are made, but only very few are hits. So this graph here is probably one of the more depressing ones that you'll probably ever see. Um, that, that big chunk, that sort of indicates how many, down, are download, how many apps are downloaded less than 100 times. If you look at this graph, most apps are downloaded less than 1,000 times. That tiny little sliver just at the top there, that's the number of apps that sell more than 50,000. So if you're thinking about getting rich quick, it, that's kind of over now. Like People aren't doing that anymore. If you look at the amount of revenue that like if all the revenue for mobile apps were divided equally between all developers, we'd get 8,500 each. And the fact is that revenue is not divided equally. So it's, it's really quite difficult to get ahead and to succeed as a business. So you've got to be, you've got to be aware of that when you enter into it. <clears throat> On the upside, a lot of these apps are kind of crap. Like if you go to the new list and you look at you know, any 100 random apps, a lot of them won't be that good. So if you just really focus on quality and delivering a tight, good user experience, you're already putting yourself in the top 10%. So yeah, focus, focus on what you're good at, make, do it really well, and then you can make your chance of success much more likely. So yeah, um, to summarize the, game market, uh, the mobile market, the big players, which weren't there when we first started out, they're starting to move in. The top 10 list, it's dominated by very few players. I think of the top 100, game loft alone were about, I think, 30% or 40%, was it? So anyway, a large number of the games which were on the top 100 list were by one company. So they're, they're really learning how to, how to dominate this market. So it's getting harder and harder for small players to enter. It's also worth, to, worth noting that the cost development is rising very rapidly. Of those top 10 games, not one of those would be made for less than half a million dollars. And when the iPhone 5 comes out, that's going to go north of one million, is my prediction. So it's still, it, even though it's getting tougher for small guys to really make a difference there, it still presents the best place to enter though. Like, I don't want to be too negative here. It's still a low barrier to entry for anyone to enter that market. And any group of guys who have got, or any people, group of people who have got the skills to get together and to make really quality apps, they can still succeed in this market. So that's why iPhone is where you should start off. Android is becoming attractive, but my general recommendation would be make it for iPhone first and get it right for that market, and then think about porting to other platforms. Uh, that's, ju that's just our approach. I don't want to push that on people, but yeah, like generally we see iOS as being a more attractive market to start off in. So yeah, it comes down to standing out. Um, so how do you stand out? And to do that, you just got to remember why you want to make games. And that's because, you know, you're passionate about games. Like, I just think about when I was like a young little kid programming games and, you know, thinking about how this is what I really wanted to do all my life and now I'm doing it and that's kick ass. So I just want to get there and make really interesting games that present new and interesting experiences to people. Um, they're also the kind of games that I want to make. Like, I like these small experiences. I like small casual games where there's like a single game mechanic that's explored to the nth degree and just to perfection. That's, that's really what interests me. So yeah, you've got to focus on your passion and you've got to develop a game that plays really well, that looks really good, and that feels really good. Kind of in that order. Like, when we, when we, when we first start making a game, we really just prototype massively. Like, we just finished a prototyping round. We spent about two months of prototyping, just make whatever prototypes we wanted. And that was like just open field. And it was interesting the way those prototypes kind of evolved. Because it would start off with one idea, and then you'd notice, oh, this little bit up here, that's kind of interesting. So you turn that into a whole game. And this whole chain of ideas would sort of, you know, this, this, this movement of ideas would occur. And you'd finally wind up at a really interesting game mechanic. So that's what we went through. So we really worked hard to absolutely refine what the interesting, what the, what the fun part of the game was. And we just absolutely focused on that. We made sure that it was pick up and play. It was fun before it looked good. It, you didn't, it didn't rely on feedback to be fun. And um, I, I'll just throw this in there. But storyline isn't gameplay. Like, a lot of people, they come to us and they go, oh, I've got a great idea for a game. It's about someone who's saving you know, their dog. And it's like, that's not a game. A game is basketball where, where you've got rules. And so we make sure those rules are correct. Then we add the story, because the story is polished and feedback upon that. So it's sort of getting those basics right before you progress. So once the game's playing awesomely, we think about how it looks. Now again, gameplay comes first, usability comes first. The art needs to complement what the game rules are. The, the art is primarily there to make it easier to understand what the rules of the game are. After that, like feedback and prettiness, that's all really secondary to actually being functional and usable. 
<coughs> and then, um, yeah, how it looks, be unique. So this game here, it's Frozen Synapse, and it's a really interesting game because it was made by a couple of indies over in the UK. And they, they were two programmers, and they didn't have an artist. So they thought, oh, this is going to be hard to make a game look good. No, they just made everything glow really nicely, and yeah, it's great. So, and that actually gave them a really unique feel as well. So they used their own weaknesses almost and made that into a strength to make a game which was distinctive and which would stand out from the crowd. And finally, the most important thing is how the game feels. Because like this game here, it's Limbo. And it just feels fantastic playing this game. You're in this immersive world, which is pretty much just shades of gray. I and mean, you'd think that'd be really boring, but it's just so textured, just the way they make you know, this. They, they really draw out your emotions and play with your heartstrings. And they give you a whole experience which really feels like it was made by one person, well, that it's the result of one person's vision. And this feeling and this texture really comes through and makes this game to be fantastic. Like, in terms of actual game rules, it's perhaps not you know, particularly amazing. Are, it is a good game, like Smart Puzzles, but why it really stands out is that it's just so distinctive and it feels so good to play it and you just want to keep coming back. So, yeah, that's essentially our approach to making games. We, we focus on making a good, fun game, and then we make it awesome. And so, yeah, I think um, yeah, that's basically what I've got to say. So, yeah, cheers. <laughs> Thank you, Tom.